Well, members and guests, we've come to that part of the evening where we have a little bit of a fireside chat and an extraordinary insight into our industry and one of our leaders. And to introduce us in that area, I'd like to call upon Aaron Ross, who's the Global Head of Resources, Energy and Infrastructure with the ANZ Banking Group, who have supported us on a handshake Moral. for more than a decade. Would you please welcome Aaron Ross to the podium. Well, thank, thank you, thank you very much. What's that? Our members and guests. What? Oh yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Fantastic. All right, members and guests. This is ANZ's tenth consecutive year as event partner to the Melbourne Mining Club here in London. We're very proud of this ongoing relationship, and we're honoured to be in your company tonight. I'd like to extend a warm welcome, welcome to all of you here tonight, and in particular, the clients of ANZ. In partnership with you, ANZ has proudly financed many mergers, acquisitions, and new project developments, and we look forward to building on those relationships for an industry which continues to shape the world. And now moving to the main event for tonight. We'll be hearing from Richard Atkinson, President and CEO of Freeport McMoran the world's premier publicly traded copper company, based in Phoenix, Arizona. Joining Richard on stage will be Lionel Barber, well known to all of you as the editor of the Financial Times. Lionel has been with the FT as editor since 2005. His transformational leadership has seen the newspaper evolve into a multi-channel global news organization. He has co-written several books and has lectured widely on foreign policy, transatlantic relations, European security, and monetary union in the United States and Europe, and appears regularly on TV and radio around the world. As editor, he has interviewed many world leaders, world business and leaders and politicians, including the former US President Barack Obama, the current sitting US President Donald Trump, and Chancellor Angela Merkel. Lionel, would you please uh, join me on stage? <laughs> and now on to Richard. Richard C. Ad Adkinson is Vice Chairman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Freeport McMoran. Prior to joining Freeport in 1989, he joined Arthur Anderson in Houston where he became the youngest ever partner at age 31 to manage the firm's global oil and gas business. At age 40, he became global head of accounting and audit practices. Over the years, he has been an active community and civic, very active in community and civic organizations. He graduated from Mississippi State University, where its School of Accountancy bears his name. As, and he has received an MBA and honorary doctorate there. He also went to Harvard, where he completed the Advanced Management Program. He continues to be a major supporter of academics and athletics at Mississippi State, his alma mater. He actively supports cancer research, serving on the board of the visitors for the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston for more than 20 years. Recently, he received the John S. McCann Leadership Award for his outstanding leadership and long-standing support of TGen, a leader in genetic research in Phoenix. This recognition was especially meaningful to Richard because, because of his close friendship to both John and Cindy McCann. Amongst his many memberships and extensive board positions, Richard is the current member and past chairman of the International Council on Mining and Metals. He is a member of the Business Council and the Business Roundtable and the Council on Foreign Relations and serves as chairman of the Advisory Council of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He was inducted into the American Mining Hall of Fame in 2010, received the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum Engineers Charles F. Rand Memorial Award in 2011 and was named Coffer Man of the Year in 2009. He was named Best CEO in Metals and Mining by Institutional Investor Magazine for eight years. Richard has also served on the board of Freeport since 2006. So members and guests, please welcome a leader's leader in the global mining industry, Richard Atkinson. Now, 
he'll move that way, he'll move that way. You climb in behind him. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank right, you. Now you can move in. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back at the uh, annual dinner, and it's a great pleasure to be sitting next to one of the, I think I can say this with English understatement, uh, a living legend <laughs> in the mining industry. So ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause. That's a good start. Uh, That's a good start. Very and I, start. I think I can, because I'm a newsman, I can reveal exclusively that it's taken about at least 10, 12 years to reel you in. Mm -hmm. But here you are, and it, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Richard, you've seen it all. You've seen fraud, corruption, <laughs> bungled deals, egos the size of one of those mines in Indonesia, debt crises, commodity crises, but here you are, you've survived. You are one of the great survivors. So, Richard, tell us, how do you survive as a CEO? Well, I sometimes look in the mirror and ask myself that. Um, you know, there's this, among the thousands of ads by insurance companies in the United States, there's one that, that says now that uh, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. And I think maybe after we have our conversation tonight, and I don't know what you're going to ask me. I'm, you know, it's always nervous to do one of these things. But um, maybe we'll have that answer after we have our conversation tonight. Jenny. So, I, I've, I, you know, again, because th there's, no, there's nothing to hide here. I got on my notes. Uh, Richard is, uh, will pretend to be an easygoing guy from the deep south. Yep. But behind that, and I think that's what we hope to get at. Th a good old southern boy. A good old southern boy. <laughs> you went to the University of Mississippi. No, you were the first. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Southern Mississippi, go on. That's Ole Miss. I Ole went Miss. to Mississippi State it's Mississippi University. State University. <laughs> I was just testing, I was just testing. I was just testing. And, and Graham, I don't know a damn thing about uh, cricket, but I love baseball and my <laughs> university's teams playing in the College World Series in Omaha no vision. tonight. And so about two o'clock, I'm gonna be sitting in my hotel room with a bottle of scotch, <laughs> listening to our game and we're catching some Static you, you were the first in your family, though, to go to college, to go to university. And you studied accountancy, and then you joined Arthur Anderson, where apparently there was such terrific infighting. I think we've got a technical issue here to deal with. OK. Uh, there's just going to be a commercial break. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, you dodged the tank shell there, didn't you, with Arthur Anderson? Well. I mean, you got out in time. Well, you know, I. Uh, no, it's all fixed. It was a. Um, I benefited from coming from a great family. I mean, my family came from very small farmers and. West Tennessee. My dad was a was a uh, real World War II story. He was a CB in the South Pacific, and then uh, we lived in small towns. I benefited from having a great education in those small towns in Mississippi, which is you know one of the smallest and poorest states in the country. Mm. Um, but I had these great women teachers. You know, when I was coming up, women and Graham, you, you're going to have to deal with this woman issue, you know. We, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, today we ask women, do you drill and blast? Because we're making every effort to bring women into our, into our industry. And uh, 
and with great success, the, the barriers that I saw for women when I started my career have gone away and now uh, there's great opportunities and we deal with problems of, uh, I'm getting way off course here. Just, just looking back, <laughs> let, let's, let, let, let's, no, but, let's but, drill a bit further though on leadership. Well, when well, did you first, when did it first come to you that you could be a CEO? So, I loved sports growing up, mm. um, and I really, uh, it was what was driving me as a young, young kid. I didn't have the athletic ability to be a, uh, a major university player, professional player. Um, I was a good student, but not a great student. Uh, but I ended up scoring really well on test. And, uh, was that preparation? No, 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 I, I, I would, I, I, was, I was not focused on school that much. And my, co my high school counselor from 50, 60 years ago just called me week before last. And he's the one that, when I scored well on a test, he called me in and said, what are you doing with your life? Mm. And so I got to college and for various reasons, I ended up in accounting and I was really good in accounting and I just threw myself into it. And and uh, had, had some really success early on. And I really loved it. I loved Arthur Anderson, you know, which had an unfortunate ending. But I thought that I, that would be my career. And, and so I had success. I got leadership positions early on. Uh, but looking back on it, I was always the, the guy that formed teams and did stuff. And, you know, I just, I just from the start, I was comfortable being a leader. What do you think was the biggest challenge that you faced as CEO of Freeport? Uh, was it the debt crisis or was it dealing with the Indonesian government? So uh, I've got to be careful here. My, my partner from Indonesia, the CEO of Interloom, is sitting here in the audience. Budi is, oh. is, is here and we've formed a great partnership. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we have a great future together. So, I, I told you it wasn't rehearsed. So, so um, you know, there have been several competing things to be the greatest challenge that I've had. Um, certainly, the, the challenge in Indonesia was significant. Uh, Freeport's been operating there 50 years. I made my first trip there in 1988. Uh, Indonesia is a country that I love a lot, but it's gone through tremendous changes over that yes. time. And, uh, and uh, it's become a democracy. It's got strong nationalism feelings. And we had great success with the most complicated mind in the world there. I mean, we have 30,000 people working mm -hmm. in Papua today mm -hmm. and a great future, which is traditionally the world's second largest copper mine and the largest gold mine as a byproduct. Grassberg. Grassberg. And so, uh, that's why I ended up going to Freeport. I came the year after Grassberg was discovered. And um, Indonesia passed a new mining law, and like so many countries around the world, there were aspirations to have more of an ownership in the assets. And it ended up with a very complicated process that literally was negotiated over a seven year period where a lot happened with Freeport and, and a lot happened with Indonesia. And it was ex extremely complex and difficult. And I'm pleased to say, uh, when I first met Booty, was going on two years ago, and he and the other ministers, we started recognizing mm -hmm. there was a way to align our interests. So resource nationalism is, is a fact of life. If you had to offer two or three tips to executives dealing with this phenomenon, either it's, whether it's in Congo or Indonesia, what would you say? So I say, first of all, to try to understand the uh, other side of the issue. Uh, I learned this in Arthur Anderson when I had global responsibilities. It's a dead end game to take your own values and your own culture in other countries and try to force it there and assume that that's the right answer. <coughs> so you have to understand why this is happening uh, you, you have to have a fair deal for the country. Now, we, we felt we had a fair deal with Indonesia before the problems, but 
I mean, I've had several opportunities where political leaders at a point in time will come and try to entice you to invest in a country and say, you can do this with little or no royalties and very favorable taxes. Yeah. The problem in our, our industry is you make investments on the front end and the revenues last for decades. And that front end deal has to be uh, something that's sustainable. And political leaders change, circumstances change, commodity prices change. And if you don't have a fair deal, you're dead in the water. And then you have to be sensitive to changes that go in the country and find ways of aligning interest and, and making it work. So you pulled off one of the great deals which created the modern Freeport, which was the Phelps Dodge deal. We don't need to go into all the financing and the money, but it was a great deal. And then a few years later, you had what you describe as seven years of hell. <laughs> Just go through that a little bit. Why was it hell? Well, just a comment too about the Phelps Dodge deal. It yeah. was a remarkable transformative deal because Freeport had been in financial issues before that. Mm. Beginning in 2003, which is when I became CEO, China emerged, copper prices rose, and we started making money hand over fist at Freeport. Uh, it was a single asset company with that asset being in Indonesia. Mm. We kept thinking somebody would acquire us. Yeah. We were out talking with people. It might still happen. Yeah, yeah, we're a public company, you know, and that, that's, that happens to public companies. But, but nobody would step up, and it was an unusual asset because it was one-third gold, two-thirds yeah. copper. Then 2006 came about, copper prices had gone from 60 cents a pound to $4 a pound. Financial markets were good. Bankers came in, spoke with us, and said we could finance the biggest mining deal ever done in the mining industry. Mm. Kathleen Quirk's my partner in crime here. She's our CFO. We just looked at each other and said, wow. And so we took that and ultimately acquired Phelps Dodge, a company that was two and a half, three times bigger than our company. Mm. We paid a premium to their shoulder, shareholders equal to our market value and uh, almost equal to it. And uh, you didn't have any doubts about that? You didn't sort of wake up at three o'clock in the morning and saying, I can't believe what I've just done? I couldn't believe that we had the opportunity. Right. I was shocked by it. I wasn't quite sure our Freeport's board would accept it. Uh, and Phelps Dodge had a reputation in the industry for having low grade Mm. assets and uh, very, very conservative management culture. And, uh, but we were able to convince the Freeport board to do it and they just gave us the green light to go do it. And I gotta tell you, once I had that opportunity and saw what we could put together to match Grassberg as a high grade, yeah. low cost asset with its gold credits, yeah. with this portfolio of low grade, high volume mm. assets, you know, the word uh, strategic benefits is frequently overused. But we showed in 2008 that that worked because Grassberg was making money when the copper price went down from $4 to $1.20 and people thought it was going to tank further. Grassberg was generating cash and we were able to keep right. the rest of the assets together. Right. When copper prices came back, it was, uh, you know, so, it was a great deal. So, so let me just come back to one thing which was really interesting, which is you had to persuade the board. Now, again, what, how did you do that? I mean, I don't believe it was all PowerPoint. How, how much bourbon was bourbon? No, it wasn't bourbon. PowerPoint at all. It was, no. it was oh, okay. first of all, we, we talked about what we were creating. Right. And so the idea that we could create a company of this size from a company that had an unusual history, had some financial challenges because of being over levered in the 2000s, to all of a sudden be able to pull off a deal like this caught, caught their attention and, and to their credit, they were very, very supportive. Uh, and, and, uh, but but kind of said, you go do it. Right. And so that's what happened. And then there was a deal which didn't go so well, which was the diversification into oil and gas. Again, we don't need to go through the full horror of that story. <laughs> um, actually, you. maybe we do. Thank you, yeah. So. What happened was uh, 
we went into the Phelps Dodge with zero debt, and we ended up with 16, 17 billion dollars of debt. Worked our way through the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 in a very effective way. China recovered quickly, and by 2011, Freeport had a share price of over $50 a share and zero debt, and just a great future. And as that was at the point that our chairman and some directors came to us with this idea of adding to the company an oil and gas element. Now, my background had been oil and gas, and the company's had when I joined it. And I just, from the start, knew that shareholders would be bitterly opposed to it. I mean, if they wanted to invest in oil and gas, they could invest in oil and gas. They didn't need Freeport to make that decision for them. But I wasn't successful in convincing the board. I was actually conflicted from any of the process because I was co-chairman of one of the companies that were acquired. So I was, didn't have a vote. I wasn't on the negotiating team. And I just sat back and watched this happen. Almost left the company. I mean, I, I, I literally, uh, I literally tried to resign the night before the board meeting and was talked out of it. And who, who talked you out of it, Jim Bob? He did, and other directors did, and others on our management team did, and and. Um, so, so if I could just stop you there, what's interesting is when to decide. Actually, I'm going to basically suck it up because I've got loyalty to share employees, it's better for me to stay on board rather than walking away on a point of principle. Right? That's right, because we would created this great company with a Phelps Dodge transaction, and we had a great, we, we, we changed the culture at Phelps Dodge, which was very bureaucratic, and uh, it was an old line US industrial company. And we had created this great atmosphere between uh, just one little fact. Sure. Phelps Dodge had a broad change of control situation. They had 16 people in their finance and administration area that had change of control contracts. Within six months, 15 of those people had left. We hired one person to replace them. We hired a new general counsel. And we filled in around it. We changed the whole culture, and, and then we lived through the hard times of 2008-2009, and I could have walked away with a big severance package, and it's all public. But how, how much? How much? It's public. <laughs> it, it, it was a big number. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I, I just didn't, I couldn't leave the rest of the people. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that, that sounds self-serving right. and everything, but it's the absolute truth. Yeah. Because none of them were involved in this. You know, it was a separate decision. An outside group came in. Right. And then there were changes that originally I was going to have a full management structure. Right. That was changed so that the oil and gas group didn't report to me. And that was frustrating. Right. So anyway, it was, it was, the, the, it was the, a tough the, deal. In the, hindsight, it was a terrible financial decision. Yeah. The For you personally. For me personally. Yeah, because it was seven figures, right? It was a big number, and uh, and uh, um, eight. But <laughs> but I, I I I really I don't regret it. No, you don't. Okay. I, I, I'm really happy that I did it because uh, I've got a great satisfaction that you know three years ago when the board was restructured yeah. and we returned the focus to copper mining. Uh, change the, the management structure. The viability of the company, you know, that $50 share price became $4. Zero debt became $20 billion of debt. And in early 2016, you all know what commodity prices were then. There were real questions about whether we were going to survive. We have. Yeah, we, it's we, an amazing turnaround we, story, we, we, I we, could we say. We reduced the debt. We're financially strong. We're going to be able to reduce it in the future. Now, with the success we've had in Indonesia, I feel personally, everybody tells me, they said, oh, you look great. I've lost a little weight, but you look great. But it's just, I didn't realize the, uh, you know, the pressure that was on me. And now, uh, you know, I'm 72 years old, and I'm really optimistic. I'm six months older than Donald Trump, by the way. 
Uh, he's yeah. running for a second term. Yeah. So uh, uh, we're, we're going to come to him in a minute. Well, anyway, uh, but I, 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 you know, it, it was seven years of yeah. the Indonesian negotiations and dealing yeah. with the oil and gas deal. They've come to good resolutions, and our company's well situated. We got some, you know, we're going to be transitioning to this big underground mine in Indonesia. But I feel great about our company. Right. Everybody around the company is smiling. We all feel good about each other. We so before we, before we talk about a couple of the bigger issues facing the mining industry, um, environmental factors, safety, just let me ask one, uh, one other question. Yeah. Um, what's it like dealing with Carl Icahn? Boy. That's the, the activist investor. It's really tough. He is a tough guy. He is a tough guy. So how do you and, deal with uh, him? Well, uh, at the time we were restructuring the board, Carl came in, took a position with the company, was threatening a proxy fight, and we entered, we entered into a standstill agreement with him. He ended up with two directors. He since sold down his position. He no longer has directors on our company. And, and so Carl was, is just a real tough guy, and he's made a ton of money by being a tough guy, you know. And, uh, you know, I just didn't back down to him. Yeah, you know, I mean, you didn't, you didn't do charm, did you? So how do you deal with him? I mean, is it judo or is it? <laughs> Man, let's see, how can I say this? Yeah. So first of all, Kathleen and I made a, uh, a bond that we were going to find a way to work with his director designees in a positive right. way. Right. And it really changed the dynamics of our board, having someone like that on your board. And we were successful doing that. We really didn't have disagreements with him on basic strategy. Where Carl and I crossed swords was he wanted us to be much more aggressive with the government of Indonesia and kind of treat the government of Indonesia like he does Hertz. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, taking threatening action. So, and I just refused to do it. Right. I refused to do it because I knew that that was a disaster. And, and he got very angry with me about it threatened to have, you know, get rid of me and not pay me any of my retirement deferred comments. And I said, do what you got to do, Carl, but I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and that was definitely the right answer because... Uh, was this on the phone or one-to-one? -one? This was uh, mostly on the phone, uh, you know, after midnight from the Fairmont Hotel in Jakarta where we were screaming with each other. So <laughs> it was... But, I, you know, I, I follow Carl. I was in Houston in the... 80s when he was involved as I was in the Pennzoil, uh, Texaco, Getty situation, and you know, you got to respect the guy for having instincts of identifying situations where there's inherent value and in structural problems because of governance or strategy, um, and uh, I just I, I just felt he was wrong in our case and still believe that he was. Richard, we've had some t terrible safety right. uh, accidents, catastrophes, the, the, the one in Brazil being the most important. What can the industry do to prevent another disastrous tone? Well, in, in, the, broader issue of, in the broader issue of safety, the saddest days in my life as a CEO are when we have uh, accidents in our company where people are hurt. And ours is a dangerous business. The nature of the physical locations where we operate and uh, the nature of the workforce and so forth, you know, mistakes can, can really be critical. And we've had some situations over the years at Freeport that we've had to deal with. And, and uh, so, Everybody in our organization understands that worker safety is the most important thing. So that's worker safety. Then the issue about environmental issues like tailings. Well, let's just take tailings because that's what you ask about. So when we bought Phelps Dodge, there were two things we were really concerned about in terms of valuation. You know, it was a public company, so we had all the public company data. And that was legacy environmental issues and 
uh, legacy employ employee health health cost. And we recognized right away, and maybe we can come back to tailings in Indonesia because I think in some ways what happened in Brazil has validated what we've done in Indonesia. Please. But, but, but in traditional tailings dam management, uh, Freeport had a limited amount of that in its history, but when we bought Phelps Dodge, Phelps Dodge had been an amalgamation of three, three companies whose operations went back until the 19th century, and we had a large group of tailings dams that had been built over time. Uh, and we recognized from the outset that that was our, our greatest risk to our company. And, and so we invested heavily in having multi-tiered monitoring and tailings. One of the good, and I don't know if this is very widely known or accepted, but one of the real strengths of Freeport is we operate every mine that we have interest in. Uh, we don't operate through joint venture companies. And so that allows us to have a common set of data, values, controls, and people involved in each of these operations. And so early on, we, uh, you know, we, we invested heavily in having multi-tiered independent reviews of tailings. Now, to give you a sense of the problem, you know, these two mines, these two tailing facilities that, <coughs> that had the problems in Brazil had you know, 30 to 70 million tons of tailings. You know, in Indonesia, we got seven, uh, three billion tons. In, in our mine, uh, Cerro Verde in Peru, which has the industry's largest uh, milling facilities, we're, we're doing about 400,000 tons a day through our, our copper mill there. Yeah. We're gonna end up with two billion tons of tailings there. Right. And maybe the largest earthen dam ever built in the history of mankind. So. You know there's a risk, you, you, and, and then we have these old tailing facilities, some of which, you know, have to be protected to protect nearby yeah. communities. So it's just something we put a lot of money into and are confident that we've, we've managed those risks in the right way. So before we move to our favorite long short, uh, where you're going to call it long or short, uh, Richard. That ain't going to um, happen. Just let me <laughs> ask you one last, one last, one follow up on this. Why hasn't the industry just come together in, in the face of that tragedy in Brazil and just said, you know what, we could do a, make a collective gesture? We're doing that. Yeah. So one of, Mitch Hook and I were talking you know, about the early formation of ICMM and how it's developed. Yeah. And so, and I've been involved in it a long time. Uh, it's really been a good organization. Mm. And you know, one thing Mining has troublesome history in a lot of ways, and we do have these worker safety issues and, and issues like tailings dam. But it's a, it's a joy for me to be in a company and in an industry where we've done so much good. I mean... It, Time to stop apologizing? Well, we've got to be realistic and improve and recognize problems and solve them. But I... I, I I'm just telling you how I feel about it. I mean, so I grew up in the American South in a racist society. You know, that was just the facts of what I grew up with. Lived in New Orleans, big Creole society. I go to the Congo. We made the biggest investment ever made in the history of the country. A country with a population the size of the UK, <coughs> as large as the US east of the Mississippi, and they had a GNP at that time of $200 per person. We go in, we give 8,000 people jobs. We provide fresh water to like 40 communities. You know, we provide education and school for people. Uh, things we've done in Papua, things we've done in Peru. I take a lot of pride. Things we're doing in the Southwest US where, you know, people talk about indigenous people, but the plight of Native Americans in the US is despicable. And you know, one of the things we're, doing is helping train Native Americans to give them a way out of the lives that they have to face now. So we do a lot of good things yeah. and I'm, I'm proud. Uh, you know, I want to come back. I know, I know you want to move on, but I want to mention the tailings management in Indonesia. Please. So we used 
one of many rivers that come off the mountain ridge, the mountain range that goes through central Papua, carries sediment down naturally to the lowlands. And rather than trying to build a standard tailings retention facility, we used one of those rivers and built a series of levees, dikes, to contain it. And now 20 years later, because of the chemical nature of our tailings, all of that, it's revegetating and we don't have the risk of a catastrophic failure. And if we try to do it, in a and we were criticized for doing that. People were just criti uh, criticizing us for using a natural river to transport tailings. But had we tried to do it any other way, the thing that you saw happening in Brazil could have happened in a massive way there. And so these tailings dams need to be site specific. It's different to having a tailings dam in the arid part of Arizona versus a high rainfall area like Brazil. The design monitoring and all needs to be different. So it's just something we have to do. Thank you, Richard. We're, we're just going to play this long short. You have to call it um, short if you think you would short go short or long. And I'm just going to throw up about six of my favorite subjects, okay. starting with, and I'll do it quite quickly because that's the way it works, copper. Long. <laughs> oh, wow, wow, oh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at least uh, he's being honest. The, the right, copper, right. You, you, you only get one go, by the way, because you just put the bet. Okay. Long. 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 Trump. And you told me you were going to be fair. So. <laughs> Think fast. Think fast. Fast. Yeah. Okay, Indonesia. Long. Louisiana. Long. We're not, we're not that involved in Louisiana anymore, right, right, but right. I love the state. Right, right. Electric cars. Long. China-U.S. trade deal. You know, you, you say it's only one answer, but these things are, these have a short-term answer and a long-term answer. <laughs> Okay. No, I'm, I'm serious yeah, about it. Yeah, no, uh, so am I. It's totally unfair, I know. No, 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 no. Yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. totally fair. It's just that one thing these 50 years have taught me in the natural resource business. I mean, I lived through the Arab oil embargo. I lived through the fall of the Shah of Iran. I lived through the early 80s, the emergence of China. You know, all these things have been part of my career. And the one thing that I've learned is don't even try to predict short-term situations. Right. Prepare yourselves for different scenarios. Right. So, you know, China, U.S., is, I'm going to be long right. in the long-term view because it's in everybody's self-interest for that. And the world, I think the great, I, I gave a, a commencement address, and I told kids there s several years ago, that I thought globalization was going to create the greatest opportunity for the world that's ever existed. And yet, today, you know, globalization's a dirty word politically in the United States. But to see countries like Indonesia over the 30-plus years that I've been going there, to see how Jakarta has emerged, to see how the people in Papua have grown, and you multiply that around the world, I just think there's a bright future for the world in seeing that underdeveloped economies and people develop and we in the developed world including the United States have to be nimble enough to adjust our own economies to take advantage of that okay last one long or short Mississippi State University oh man I'm I'm all in dead long for that <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> Come. Oh, good. Q and A. Oh, Q and A. Right. So I thought we. Ben, have you got me in there? Great. So it's now your area. You've got Sam Street up this end. 
Rob Kennedy at this end. Already, S Sam, if you've got someone who wants to ask a question, uh, if you do ask a question, would you please stand up and identify yourself? Uh, we've got one here, so please, sir. See if, did I screw this up or can you? That's cool, that's, that's good. good. No, okay. no, we can hear. Sorry, I shouldn't. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Mitch Lim. I'm from a firm called Tamasis Partners. Um, I've got a question, I think, and Lionel touched on it a bit um, as well, which is mainly about leadership. And specifically, um, yourself, you don't come from a traditional uh, mining background. You're not a mining engineer, you're not a geologist. So I was just interested to hear your thoughts on um, where you think uh, it's important for management in the mining industry to be mining people with mining backgrounds. And you know, we all like to think of ourselves as a very sp a special, specific industry, but can you, uh, you know, should we be looking more broadly for leadership talent outside of uh, our industry itself and into uh, Would you go into and all kinds of different industries? Handheld microphone. So I'll start by telling you a story when Jim Bob came to me and uh, asked me to join Freeport. Um, I had gotten, dis as you referred to, I got dissatisfied when Arthur Anderson was having this internal fight between what's now Accenture and the traditional firm. And I went back to Houston and I was offered a position as CFO of a major, uh, of a in large independent oil and gas company. When Jim Bob heard it, he came to me and said, if you're leaving Arthur Anderson, you, you need to come to Freeport. I'll pay you more money, we'll have fun, you'll do things. And he said, but I want you to clearly, this was 1988 or 9, I want you to clearly understand you'll never be CEO of Freeport because I don't believe an accountant or a financial guy can be CEO of a natural resource company. And I said, I'm gonna prove you wrong. He got real mad at me, I mean, real mad. And, and yet, you know, you look back over my history now, more CEOs of resource companies have had a financial background than really a technical background. Whether you have a technical background or a financial background, you have to make a, tradition, a transition of being able to work with people where you're not a, a, a technical expert. And that requires you to learn to identify people and learn how to communicate people and read them. And that's going to happen regardless of where you're coming from. Now, I'm a very informal guy. We have a very informal situation at Freeport. Uh, friends of mine who are, over the years have been CEOs of much larger companies have complained that they just have to spend their time in out resource uh, managing human, re human relations kind of things, management issues, capital allocation. We've got a small enough company, if we have a problem like we had in Indonesia and asset management, uh, balance sheet management, I get involved. I mean, I'm a roll up your sleeves, you know, person not there just screaming at somebody else for not getting the job done. And we, we have a team approach to everything, very fluid. So we look for people, you, you have to be an expert in something to rise up in your career. You know, you need to learn to be really good at something to create value. And then you get to a certain level of are you going to be in that one area, which is fine if, if you're good, or if you want to expand, you've got to learn how to, you've got to learn how to work with people and learn how to read people. You know, you have to be decisive. If somebody's not doing a job, you've got to respond to that. You've got to encourage people, and you've got to make sure that you, you know. My style is to listen to people, to encourage people to talk, and then we make a decision, I'm pretty decisive about making that decision and then insisting that people uh, adhere to it. I hate bickering. You know, if I get a couple of people in our company that, are, that I hear are bickering with each other, I call them both in my office and just tell them it's, it's not acceptable. You know, you gotta not let personal ambition, not let uh, uh, things other than getting the work done come into play there. I think part of my training with Arthur Anderson is serving clients, where you had to work with clients, you know, and not have the authority to do it, but get your ideas across and get it done that way mm. was good. Uh, 
but you know, there's not just one style, but if, at Freeport, we, you know, there's no deal about if somebody has an issue they want to talk to me about, the door's open, you can call me. If it's in a finance area, Kathleen's not going to get upset about, about me, me getting involved. She may not agree with my answer, but, you know, and so I'm involved. Uh, Javier Targetta's here. He manages our, our global concentrate marketing activities as well as our business in Spain. And Javier and I have a personal relationship. For years, he reported to me. I don't have so many people reporting to me anymore. But that doesn't mean Javier has any reluctance about calling me and talking to me about a problem. Okay, Sam, you have a question here. And then we have a question from Rob here. And I think we'll cover that given the time. Uh, g'day, Richard. Is that on? It's right. Oh. G'day, Richard. Uh, Colin Moorhead. Um, uh, Executive Director of Medeca Copper Gold, based in Jakarta, and former uh, immediate past president of the OZWM. Firstly, congratulations on your stewardship of getting that deal through. Uh, everybody watched it very carefully. Um, you've also actively involved in the ICMM. Uh, it seems to be a symbiotic relationship, the development of the environmental uh, sustainable development goals and uh, your experiences in Freeport. Um, so what comes first, the chicken and the egg? You, who, who, who wins out of that deal? I th you've obviously brought a lot to the ICMM and the ICMM's brought a lot to Freeport. And do you see a role for, for uh, CEOs uh, playing a wider role in the industry rather than just working on their own businesses? I didn't catch no, I think it's, do you see a, how much, or should there be a wider role for CEOs other than just running their own businesses? Oh, no question about that. So, just a couple of observations. I was fortunate enough as a young guy to get a lot of uh, public prominence uh, because of the role I had. I mean, I was testifying before Congress, I was talking to reporters, I was giving speeches. A lot of guys who come up in the ranks and become CEOs without having some of that, it gets to be too important to them. You know, I, I support charities and I enjoy, I do things outside work, but, but I've watched CEOs who all of a sudden they, they're anointed to be CEO and then they wanna just be in every organization, they wanna go to every function, they have a big team of people following them around and you can just see it's a matter of pride that they like. You get your eye off the ball of your business and that's gonna be a bad problem. You know, your first job is running the company. But then we have responsibilities and that's what worked so well with ICMM. When I first got into ICM, we'd go to meetings, my first couple of meetings, and it'd be this long table in London and there'd be the council member and they'd have two, three or four aides behind them and there'd be some guy with some academic with a British accent reading the paper <laughs> and people were going to sleep and I was very close friends with Lee Clifford, Chip Goodyear, Wayne Murdy, the, the CEOs at that time and that's been a great part of my career is I've had great friendships with all these different people that have been CEOs of companies. We've developed personal relationships that are that are deep and so I called them all together and I said let's change this. Let's have meetings with nobody else there except the CEOs. Let's not have formal presentations, distribute material before the meetings and talk it out. Mitch was there and remembers all that. And, uh, and so I think that's helped ICMM devolve into a much more effective organization that's CEO led and can respond to some of the issues like, like you said, we're not perfect. We've got lots of things to address and deal with. And, you know, there are times when people in that room are at each other's throats. I mean, you just know the history of the mining industry, what's going on between companies. So it's a challenge to keep everybody on the same page. But when we do that and address issues, this tailing is going to be a big test. But, you know, we've come up with these uh, standards of best standards of conduct. We have outside reviews of that. You know, we're able to. Uh, uh, to improve practices across the industry by doing that. So, uh, 
anyway, like so many other things, it comes down to personal relationships and credibility and, and candor and uh, transparency in the way that you deal with things. You know, I, uh, we have different views on this tailings issue. I'm concerned that uh, how it might affect our company and you know, we've got to work all that through. Okay, Richard, one last question from here. Uh, Richard, maybe a bit of a technical question for you. Uh, block caves. Yes. You guys are in the uh, process of sort of transitioning to one of the biggest new block caves in the world. Our, our friends here at Rio Tinto, similar sort of transition to a big block cave over in Mongolia. How do you think about the risks of ramping up these big new block caves? What do you think that means for copper supply demand? Yeah. So just just to make sure everybody has a understanding of what we're undertaking at PTFI now. The Grassburg, Freeport's been uh, producing there almost 50 years. Um, the Grassburg was discovered in 1988 and this enormous open pit mine. There were years where we're mo moving a million tons of uh, material a day out of the, out of the open pit. And uh, this is at 14,000 feet, five degrees off the equator where it rains two to 400 inches a year. And uh, above the world's second largest tropical rainforest and some of the most interesting people you'll ever meet in your life. And uh, so we've completed where you can economically mi mine from the open pit. And so now we're transitioning to what will be the industry's largest block cave operation. We have two mineralized system one's directly underneath the grass bird. The one, the other one was the original open pit mine and we've been block cave mining there since the early 1980s and very successfully. So we're looking to in two, three years time to be processing 200 to 220,000 tons a day from underground mine in a single operation. Yeah, that's never been done before. But when you break it down, each one of these ore bodies are going to have separate headings. So in the Grassburg block cave itself, it's going to have three headings, which will be like three size mines that we've already done. And the adjoining deep MLZ mine will have two. So, you know, investors and the industry are watching us. I tell people we're in a show me time. We, we've got to execute and that's, our total strategic focus in our company is on that execution right now, making as much money as we can out of the rest of the, the other mines in the Americas. Uh, but we're confident we can do it and technology is well established. We know the ore bodies and, you know, it's, uh, but you know, we got two years, we're gonna have reduced volumes because we can't mine the open pit while we're caving the, 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 the surface where it was mined. So uh, it's a transition time for us. Thank you. Okay, Richard, thank you for that. Lionel, thank you for that. We come to that moment where we do a vote of thanks and we have to offer that vote of thanks uh, Patrick Smith, the CEO of AMC, and John Tivy, the, uh, the partner in Mines and Metals uh, from White and Case. So that will come alive as soon as you come aboard. We can take the headset off now, That's Richard. Good. It's, it's right. been a pain in the backside, that. Grab that out of your pocket, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lionel. Another fantastic Melbourne Mining Club event here at Lords. I'm delighted to present a vote of thanks on behalf of myself and John Tibby from White and Case. Richard described himself as a guy who formed teams and did stuff. Such a simple phrase. Leadership is about achieving results through people and with people but I'm not sure I've ever heard leadership described so humbly before. A guy who formed teams and did stuff. Members and guests, please join me and John in thanking a leader's leader, Richard Adkinson. Now, of course, of course we, can't, we can't let Lionel go uh, without uh, uh, enjoying uh, a very fine bottle of Australian red wine. 
and Tiff, and get that the same bottle. And take that out. This is a gift. This is a gift that we give to all our CEOs, uh, and it's entirely appropriate for the boardroom. <laughs>